Hi, welcome to Kids Code Camp 2020. Thank you for joining me in my Python class. There are a few things we need to discuss before we get started. So going down the list, first we want to make sure that you know where to go and get help when you need it because you will get stuck, you will get confused, there will be problems, and we want to make sure that you can overcome it and learn from it. So if you have any questions, post a question in the forums at kidscodecamp.org. We'll be in there watching and helping. Next, it's important that you watch the videos in order. For Python, there's an installation instructions video that shows you how to get the software installed, and that's the first thing you should watch. Next, there's a Python primer that teaches you the Python language, especially as it applies to creating video games. And then this video should have been last. If you haven't watched those previous two videos, you need to go back and do those first. And you can find those at kidscodecamp.org. If you do get stuck, there's a reset script. We'll talk about that later. Don't forget to do that. And you can download the source code at the URL on your screen. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But in that source code, to make it easier, there's also uh, a document that where I typed out all the source code I'm going to be going over in the video uh, to make it easier. The Python Coding Steps document is a Google Doc, and you can get to it at the URL on that last bullet point there at bit.ly slash kcc2020-python-steps. So go in there if you have a hard time following along with the typing in the video, and you can just look at it on screen and follow along with it if that works better for you. And with that, let's get started. Let's get started right away by downloading the source code. We'll open a Chrome browser. You can open any browser you like. I'm going to use Chrome. We'll go to github.com slash nunug, N-U-N-U-G, and press Enter. You'll find the KCC 2020 repo right here. Click the link. And in the upper right corner, find the clone button. Click the drop down. Then click the download zip button. Now this is very important. If you're in Windows, what you want to do is go to the quick access bar on the left here and find documents. Click on it. And then you want to create a new folder. You can either click on the new folder button or you can press Control N on the keyboard. When the folder comes up, go ahead and click on type KCC2020 and press enter. If you're using a Mac, what you want to do instead is navigate to the home directory and then create a directory under that called KCC2020. You can navigate to the home directory by typing tilde slash. The tilde is the squiggly character on the tick button next to the one key on the keyboard, on a standard keyboard. Once that's created, go into the folder and click Save. Now it's very important that you remember this directory, where you put these files, uh, and where you unzip it. We're going to be using this a lot. Okay, we're going to unzip the zip file. Double click on the master zip file. Then double click on the master folder inside. Then press Control A on the keyboard or drag your mouse from corner to corner across all the items to select them. Then right click and click copy from the menu or press Control C on Windows or Command C on a Mac. Then click the up arrow twice. And press Control V on Windows, Command V on Mac or right click and click paste. Okay, now this has folders for other games in Kids Code Camp. We're going to be working with the Python folder. So, this is the path that we're going to be working with. We need to remember what that is. Now that we have that, we can begin. Now, I assume you've installed all the software as instructed in the installation video. So, on Windows, click Start or on Mac press control space sorry command space to open spotlight and then type code and it should bring up Visual Studio code in the insight here press enter now it should come up looking something like this we can close the welcome page if you like yours may look 
different color, but as long as it says Visual Studio Code up here, we should be in good shape. So click on File, and then click Open Folder. Now you need to navigate to the directory we were just in. So in Windows it's under Documents, KCC 2020, Python, and then Select Folder. If you're on a Mac, of course it's slash tilde to get to your home directory, then KCC 2020 slash Python. Once the folder is open, this icon shows the Explorer, and you should see files and folders in this list. If we click on Source, this is all of the game source code. If I click on Assets, this is all of the game's graphics, sound, and tile data. So as long as you see that, we should be good to go. Let's go over some of the graphics first. Let's go over how I made some of the assets in the folder here. Let's open paint.net. And let's go see what we have in the assets folders. So again, go to Documents, KCC 2020, Python, and then in the Assets folder, we have a Graphics folder. And these are all the graphics for the Gobbler game. So you can see that I have eight graphics for Gobbler himself, four color graphics for the ghosts, and one scared ghost. Some of these others won't be used in this game, but they're there if you wanted to extend it if you feel like doing that yourself after the class, so I've included those. I'm going to open all of the gobblers and the gobbler sprite sheet, or, uh, sorry, the gobbler PDN file. The PDN file is a main paint.net project file. I'll maximize that. Each one of these you can see is an individual image. But here in this image, I have several of them. This is called a sprite sheet. And what I did was I put a single image here, and then I make him about this big. So he takes up a relatively square area. And then in order to make all these guys the same size, it was easy for me to create a new layer by clicking the plus button here in the corner. And then I press F4 to give it a name and I type slots. And when this checkbox is checked, this layer is visible. It's below the sprites layer, so it's in the background. If I were to drag it up, it would now be in the foreground and it would cover the sprites. But in the sprites layer, I have all of these guys in their own little box. Because I have this slots layer, I can go and select just that one section, and as long as I have this selection there, I can't accidentally draw outside of that region. I'll show you. I can draw on the background, but I can't draw outside of the box. Only inside the box. And that's useful. Once I've drawn all of these guys, I can take off the background, and this little checkerboard pattern in the background indicates that this area is transparent, and that's important. So once I have that all done, I can click Save and have a sprite sheet. Because the software that I'm using doesn't work well with transparency, it had some problems, so I had to cut them up into individual images and save each as their own PNG file. So, each of these PNG files is one frame of the gobbler. Because, and as I animate him, I have a op closed mouth, an open mouth, and a closed mouth, and I do this back and forth like that, and you can see that he almost looks like he's moving with just two frames. But I have two frames for each direction. Here's down, left, right, and up. So these are the image for Gobbler, and 
I just used the paintbrush in two layers, one for the slots, one for the foreground, and then I save it without the background turned on, and I end up with sprites. I did the same thing with all of the ghosts. I just created them all in a single sprite sheet, and then I cut them up into individual images, so they're all the same size and in relatively the same position. So that's how I created the graphics. It's really simple, and there aren't that many of them. There is another aspect to the graphics, which are tiles. And I drew a tile sheet for the tile map, and I did that in Paint.net too, but I did it a little bit differently. I'll show you that too. When I create images for the tile maps, I save them in a different directory. Instead of in graphics, I go back up to assets and then down to tiles. And here are the sprite sheets. So again, PDN is the main project file for Paint.net. I'll open that. And this may look a little strange right now, but let me show you why. I'll show you why it looks like that. If I take off the background, then it's all transparent. The reason I have the background there is so that I don't run into some problems that I've had with transparency. If I zoom in here, you'll see that I have some odd graphics here. And this will make more sense when we look at the tile map. But each of these is used to create the background of the maze. Another thing that I do is I have a layer here called grid. And if I turn that on so we can see it, you'll see that it's primarily just a whole bunch of black squares. Each one is two pixels by two pixels for a total of four. And they are eight pixels from one to another, left to right, and eight pixels top to bottom. So I know if I want to make a tile that's 8 pixels by 8 pixels, I can just keep it within the bounds of this rectangle, and I'll have an 8 by 8 tile. And I can do that with a whole array of them as a grid. So it makes it very easy to make 8 by 8 tiled graphics. So once I have a tile map like this, I can turn that grid layer off, turn on the background, and I'll save it as a PNG, and that's what it will look like. Then I open it with the Tiled Editor. The Tiled Editor lets me draw maps from tile sheets. So in this tile map, I have a few different layers. And here's the tile sheet that I had in paint.net. So now it makes a little more sense, right? I have a pellet here, and I've drawn those in every other box in this grid. I have a set of nine blocks that compose a large power, power pellet, and I decided that it was just too big, and so I'm only going to use one little tile for a power pellet. And that's the one you see here on the map. I have green and red, and I use those for the paths that the ghosts and gobbler will walk on. If I don't have a path here, they can't go there. So of course if I don't have a path going through a wall, they can't go through a wall. That's what the paths are for. It dictates where they can go and where they can't. And these blue bars obviously form the walls. Now I also have one of these, this one. Which, is, which I use as the black background. It's important that I always use this one and not this one or these ones over here. I have to use the same one, otherwise things can get messy. You want to make sure you always use the same one. Now, I have four layers here that I can turn on and off. If I turn off the paths, then it looks like the actual game. The pellets and the maze and nothing more. If I want to see or edit those layers, I want to turn them on select them and then pick the tiles, I can just draw them on here. For example, if I wanted to block off a path, I could just go like this. Whoop! Make sense? So, I can just draw it how I like. 
I can use undo, wipe out all of that, make it proper again. There we go. And now I have an edited map, and I'll save this as a TMX file, and I can import that using a library into my game. Okay, before we get started coding this game, why don't I show you how the game actually looks. To help you keep up in class, keep you from getting stuck, if you get stuck you can use the resets script. The reset script will allow you to go to the beginning of any one of the 15 steps throughout the class, so that if you've made a typing mistake and can't find it, or you're getting an error that you can't figure out, you can always use reset to get back to the beginning of the step and try again, so you don't have to start at the beginning. So here's the script that does it, reset.ps1. If you're on a Mac, you'll have to use reset.py instead. If I press Control J, I'll get a prompt. In Windows, it's a PowerShell prompt. In Mac, I think it's Bash. Uh, I don't actually see my prompt. If you, that happens to you, just press Enter and it'll show up. So type CD space source and press Enter. And then you can type on Windows. You can type dot slash reset and press Enter. But you'll get this error. It says that it's not digitally signed. So you'll need to type well, click on Start, type PowerShell, and then right-click on this icon up here, and click Run as Administrator, and click Yes when you get the UAP prompt, UAP, uh, e-prompt, and then type Set-EX and press the Tab key, and it should bring up Set-Execution Policy, then press Space, and type R, Tab, and it should come up with remote signed. When that looks right, go ahead and press enter and it'll ask if you want to perform this operation. Tell it Y, enter. And now, when you run this, just press the up arrow and it will type it again for you. You should still get that same error. So the next step is we go to the source folder you're probably in the Python folder. Go to Source, and then right-click on Reset.ps1, and click Properties. And then on the General tab, there's an Unblock checkbox here. Click that, and click Apply. Now if we come back in here, press the up arrow, press Enter, the script will run. If you're running a Mac, you don't have this problem. But instead, you'll have to type Python 3 space reset dot pi. You remember to do it that way if you're on a Mac. I'm running Windows, so I'm just going to run re the reset script. And it'll ask me which step I want to go to. There are steps 1 through 15. Step 1 is going to be the first starting point, and it's just an empty file. And we'll fill it out as we go. And to run the final game, go to step 0. And I put a slash there. Try again. There we go. And now if I want to run the game, I can type dot slash run. On a Mac, you'll need to type Python 3 space reset, sorry, gobbler dot pi. Since I'm on Windows, I'm going to type dot slash run. And it gives me the same error. I have to go do it again to this other file, to the other script. Right click, properties, general tab, unblock, apply, OK. Up arrow, and try again. And now I'll run the game. So I'll run around the maze, collecting pellets, without getting eaten by the ghosts. If I eat a power pellet, the ghosts will become afraid and run away. And I can chomp them. If they're not scared, I can't chomp them, and they'll get me. 
And then we'll die. I can press escape to exit the game, and that's it. If I eat all the pellets, then I win. So if you run into any problems running PowerShell scripts because of those errors, you can always work around it the hard way just by typing python space reset.py if you want to use the reset, or python space gobbler.py to run the game. So why don't we get started with the game? I'm going to go to step one. I'll type dot slash reset. Tell it step one. and then my source code will be in a state that I can start working on it. The file we're going to be editing is gobbler.py. If I click on it once, it shows up in the editor, but this is called code lens. It's really just showing you the contents. It's not editing it. You see that the title on the tab here is in italics. That means that if I click something else, this is going to go away. To make it stick, I'll double click on it. Now you see that the title is no longer in italics and it shows up under the open editors, that means I can edit the file. If I just clicked on it and made change, it would also make it stick. But you want to make sure that it's not in italics. So, let's begin. First thing I'm going to want to do is import Pygame, and that's going to bring in the library that contains all the graphics, sound, and music. There are a couple of other things that we'll use that aren't quite in that one. So, from pygame.locals, we'll import everything. So, import means that somebody has written a library in Python, and we want to use their code instead of writing our own. So we tell it that this file wants to have those pieces of code available to it, One last thing we want to import is sys. That system library is going to give us the opportunity to exit the program. That's important, right? Now that we have Pygame in our game, we need to initialize it. This is going to run at startup, and we'll just type pygame.init, open and close parentheses. So let me explain what's going on. Pygame is a module. This is a library that contains code. It has an init function in it that we want to call. So w when I say init, that means it's a function. And remember in our tutorial, functions have open and close parentheses in order to s specify a parameter list. And this one's empty because we're just not passing any parameters. But this is how we tell our function to be executed. If we don't put those open and close parentheses, it does something very different, and it won't run the way we want it to. Okay? Next, we're going to put in a comment. Just so that we can keep track of what each area of the code is doing. That way we don't have to focus on what the code is and understand it to try and find our way through the program. We could just look and know what it's doing. Next we'll set up the screen because we need a window that we can draw our graphics in. So first we need to decide how big it's going to be. So I have a maze made up of 8 by 8 tiles. And I know that my maze is 55 tiles wide 61 tiles high, and that each of those tiles is 8 pixels high and 8 pixels wide. So rather than going and doing the math and determining how big that area is, I'm going to let the computer calculate it for me. This is the multiplication operator, the star. So this is going to say 55 times 8 pixels wide and 61 times 8 pixels high. And now remember these parentheses? That means I'm putting these into a tuple. And then I'm going to stick that tuple into a screen size variable. 
and then when I hover over it, you can see that it tells me that screen size is a tuple. Great. Now, the screen object, uh, the screen variable, is going to hold an object returned by pygameDisplay.setMode, which is a function, and that function result is going to be a screen. So in the parameters list here, we need to specify the screen size. But the screen size is not a tuple that it expects. It expects a list. So we need to say screen size element at index 0, because I can get to the first element of a tuple by indexing at 0, and then screen size element at index 1. So I basically take this, and it's the same as this, and this is the same as this. So I break up that screen size tuple and pass each of its bits into a list, which I then pass to set mode. Set mode returns a screen object that we store in the screen variable. We'll use that screen later to draw our graphics on. And then the set caption is going to just put some text in the title bar of the window. This is not necessarily required, but it makes it a little more professional. Next, we're going to set up the game loop. And the only thing we really need for it right now is we need to know our target frames per second, because we're going to use that for timing. Next is the game loop. Now the game loop is an infinite loop, so we're going to say while true and then put a colon to start a code block and then it's going to run forever. Now, this is our first code block. Now before we go any further let's talk about uh, one thing that's going to be confusing for a lot of you is the spaces versus the tabs. Now Python people really think that you should use four spaces. I'm going to tell you to use tabs just because you're a beginner and I've taught this class for many years and it always causes problems when you try to use spaces. It's very confusing for new people. But regardless of what you choose, I think the best thing to do is to come up here to view and then find render white space and click it on and now you're going to see a little arrow here that indicates when you have a tab and you'll see a little dot when you have a space. I think this is very important for you to have so that you can see what your white space looks like. So you can see if you have a, ta whoop, a tab on this line and, yeah, and then spaces on that line. You can see the difference here if there's an arrow instead of four dots. So if I have a code block that looks like this, I'm going to have a problem that's going to give me errors. So turn that setting on so you can see what's going on and you won't have nearly as much trouble. So with that said, we can proceed with the game loop, and the first thing we need to do is we need some timing in it, because a computer runs very, very fast, and if we don't slow it down, our game will just run away, and we'll barely even see it. So any good game library has timing stuff built into it that we can use, and Pygame, Pygame does as well. So pygame.time.clock is a function that returns a clock object, and that clock object has a, a dot tick function, and it takes a frames per second parameter, and that's an int or integer. So what I'm telling this thing to do is to wait until a 60 frames per second period has elapsed, whatever time that is, and then it's going to proceed with whatever's coming after that in the code, in the loop. So that puts in just a little pause to slow things down. Next, I'm going to look at the game events to see if the user has quit the program. I'll explain that as I go. We're going to do a for loop, remember those? We'll use an event variable for each item in the pygame.event.get functions list result. This function will return a collection of game events, and it'll be empty if there are no events, but you'll still get a list with nothing in it that you can iterate through. So we'll start a code block, 
and then for every event returned by the get function, each one will be stuck into the event variable one at a time. Add a comment, and then I'll check to see if the event type is equal to the pygame.quit constant. This is a value, and I don't have to know what it is, I just have to know what it's called, like a variable. So if the value in the quit constant is the same as the event type, then this code block will execute. sys.exit. Remember that we did an import sys above, and it has an exit function. So the exit function will terminate our program. That happens if the, any event that's given to us is the quit event. So when does that happen? It happens when they click the X on the title bar. But we also want to see if we also want it to close when they hit the escape key. So I'm going to add a little bit more. Uh, let me show you what just happened there. I press enter twice and you can see that it kept the indentation and put it in automatically for me. I have three tabs here. But I don't want to stay in this code block. I want to go out of the code block. So I'm just going to backspace one tab and now I'm out of the code block. Make sure you're paying attention to your indentation. Python cares what it is, and it's got to be right. Okay, if the event type equals a key down event, pygame.key down, then this code block will execute. So, key down means that a key was pressed on the keyboard, but I don't know which one it was yet. I need to see event.key and check to see if it was k underscore escape. And if it was, we will sys.exit, just like before. Okay, so I'm going to come out of that code block to the code block that was outside of that, and now out of the event code block. So I can see this line shows me what I'm currently lined up with. I'm outside that for loop. So this is the end of our program for now. And I'm going to go back just one more and say this is the end of the game loop. That's a pretty small game loop. It doesn't really do anything right now except show us a window and let us close the window. But that's enough for now. Before I go any further, you can see that in this tab I have a little a dot on it. If I hover over it, it becomes an X. But in the meantime, it's a dot. That means that I've made changes to this file and those changes have not been saved to disk. As long as there are changes that are not saved to disk, they won't be part of your program. You always have to remember to save your file before you try it out. So, I'm going to press Alt-F-S on the keyboard, because that's the way I prefer to do it. You can also do, do Control-S or click File, and then Save, and then that dot goes away. Okay, now it also shows... Uh, mine is set up to show that if I make a change to the file, it turns red right here but you can just ignore that. It probably won't do that on your system. Now I can come into my terminal down here, and if it's not there, just press Control-J again, and make sure that you're in the Python slash source directory. I can type dot slash run, and I've got an error. So let's go up and see what it is. It's in goblin, gobbler pie line 9. Scroll up to line 9 and it looks like I typed it wrong, and I need to make the correction. It should be from pygame.locals import star. Now you see that I've got the dot again. I need to save again. Alt F S and I'll try again. Press the up arrow to repeat myself. 
and I have another error. So goes the process. We do this all the time. We just have to go through it over and over until everything is perfect. So gobbler.py, same file, line 17. And here's line 17. And I can see that I have an open square bracket over here, but I don't have a closing square bracket for it. It looks like there's one right there, but it belongs to this guy, not this guy. So I need to add a second closing square bracket, and that'll fix it. See the dot? Save the file. Up arrow, try again. And now it works. So far, it brought up a window. You can see that in the title bar it says gobbler, because we added the line to make it do that. Otherwise it would just say Python. And if I click the X button, it should close. Good. Now I'll run it again. And if I press the escape key, it should close. Great. Everything's working. So that was the end of step one. Now we have an empty game that we can add to, add on one step at a time until we have a full and proper game. Okay. We started at step one, and now we've added the code and made it to step two. So at this point, we're at step two. Next, we'll go on to add code until we make it to step three. But if you've gotten stuck and you haven't gotten the code to work to this point, uh, to get where you should be, just do a reset and go to step two. Now, before we get any further, step three is going to be about drawing the maze. And the maze is a tile map. So let's have a look at some of the code throughout the game so that you understand what's in it in case you want to take a look or if you get lost or uh, if you just want to understand better. So over here in the source folder we have source files all the way from here down to here. So the directions is a really simple file and it just has uh, an x and a y direction as a tuple. Then it has a couple of uh, supporting things just to make things easier. Functions is my game functions class. It has all kinds of functions in it just to help me out and keep all of this code out of the main gobbler file. None of it's very hard, but it's very verbose and we just don't need to have it in there confusing things. And this is how you should write functions anyway. Take instructions that perform a task and put them all in a function so that you can call them repeatedly and whenever you need. Game data is just primarily data. It's a class, but it really only contains data. It has some file names for the sounds, it has positions and locations on the screen for graphics, and it has file names for the graphics, and that's about it. Ghost paths represents the map for the paths that the ghosts can walk on. Ghost sprite represents the graphics and the behaviors for the ghosts. Gobbler Pi is the main file we're editing. Gobbler paths is the tile map for the gobbler's paths. And gobbler sprite, like ghost sprite, represents the graphics and behaviors for the gobbler character. The graphics pie contains graphics class, and he does all of the calculations for uh, loading uh, images and calculating positions and graphics on the screen. So if I want to draw a tile or, or tile maps, it knows how to do all of that. If I want to draw one of the sprites, it handles it. Maze represents the tile map for the background for the maze. Maze sprite is what's called a base class for the other sprites. Remember that I said that classes can inherit behavior and functionality from other classes? This is a class that is inherited by the ghost sprites and the gobbler sprite. So a lot of the sprite functionality is very similar between all of these, and we take all of that sim similarity and put them into a single class that they all inherit. That way I only have to write that code once. Navigators is a file that contains the Navigator class and other navigators that inherit the Navigator class. The Navigator classes are used by the ghosts and the gob gobbler to decide how to run around the maze, which direction to go, and why. 
pellets is a tile map that represents all of the pellets in the maze. Remember they were drawn in the tiled map editor as well. They're just a little bit different than the others because that map changes as Gobbler runs around, whereas none of the other tile maps ever change. I've drawn them on the tile editor and that's where they stay, but pellets is different. Then we have the reset scripts and run script. Then the sounds.py is uh, it has a game sounds class and all it does is play sounds and music. And it's pretty simple and we'll cover that in a later step. TMX data is a little more complex because it's the way that I access all of the tile maps. I won't get too far into it, but it's, it's not very long, but it knows about each layer in the tile map and it allows me to get that data so that I can work with it uh, and make graphics out of it. So the maze and the pellets and the ghost paths and the gobbler paths all use this class to get their hands on the tiled map data. And then TMX loaded layer is another part of that. The TMX uh, is the tiled map file. The TMX loaded layer is where it actually stores the map data after the TMX data class has loaded it. So, given that knowledge, the tile map used to draw the maze starts with TMX data and it loads the tile data from the data file and it stores it into an instance of the TMX loaded layer and then this object uh, th sorry this class is inherited by the maze class you can see that its base class is TMX loaded layer right here and so there's not much functionality in the maze file because most of it is inherited from TMX loaded layer. So we'll go back to Gobbler Pi and I'm going to add some imports import TMX data import graphics, uh, no, import maze, and then import graphics, import functions, there, sorry about that. We've imported all of the files that we described just a moment ago that contain all the tile data in them. And now I need to create some variables for that. First I'm going to create the graphics object by calling the name of the graphics class and give it parentheses. So this takes a class and creates an object from it. I get a graphics object and store it in the variable G. And I need one of those because on the next line I do the same thing to create the game functions. And game functions takes a parameter of type graphics. So I needed a graphics object in a variable to pass into it. So now I have graphics and game functions. With those, I can create tile sets. So TMX data equals a new uh, TMX data dot TMX data. I'll create an instance of this object as well stored in the TMX data variable and that's going to load all the entire data from the TMX file. And once that's loaded I can get the maze object maze equals maze dot maze I'll specify the class name and pass the tile data it needs. So remember that it's case sensitive so this is a capital M and this is a lowercase m and they have to be right. 
Now this maze module is what I imported up here. And maze with a capital M is the class that's inside it. So now I have a maze object stored in my maze variable. So with that maze variable, I should be able to draw a maze on the screen. And we'll see some graphics. So I'm going to come down here to the end of the loop, backspace, 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 and I'm still inside my while loop right here. So that's one tab in. And so I'm going to first make the screen white. And that way, if I'm drawing the map properly, I shouldn't see any white. And this will show me if I'm doing it wrong or not. I can remove that later if all is well. Then I'm going to use the graphics object, and it has a draw maze function. And that takes two parameters. It takes the maze, and it takes the screen. Because it needs to know what to draw, and it needs to know where to draw it. that should pretty much do it, but there's a problem. I'll show you what it is. First save it, and look for those dots. If you see those dots, save it. And then run. Now, I don't see my maze. And I probably did everything right, but it just doesn't show up on the screen. I'll show you why that is. When you use modern graphics, we draw to a background area, a uh, background surface is what Pygame Pi calls it. And those things don't actually show up on the monitor screen. We can do a whole lot of drawing in that background, and it's a lot faster that way, but once we have everything all set up as we want it to show on the screen finally, we need to tell it to take that background area and put it in the area that's shown on the screen. We do that by saying pygame.display.update open close paren that dot update method is going to tell it to look from one area of the video memory to another now look what we have it's a maze okay so that should complete step two and we're moving on to step three if you're stuck or for any other reason you need to, right now, go ahead and do a reset to step three. Okay, step four. Step four should be pretty easy because it's pretty much the same thing as the maze. We're going to add another tile layer, but we've already got our imports, so a lot of that's already done for us. So what we're going to do is import pellets, And the pellets class, like I said, is a little bit different, if you recall, because it's the only layer that changes in the middle of the game. So, down here under the maze, we're going to say pellets template equals a new pellet object. And that object requires the TMX data, tile data. And now with the pellet templates object, we create a pellets object. And remember, the object has the name of its class. I'm just naming the variable the same thing because it makes sense here to do so. But when I say that this is pellets, this is not, that doesn't make it a pellets class. I could name this anything I want to because it's a variable. But I'm going to assign it the result of pellets pellets and pass TMX data we get a new pellets pellets object and now that I have two of these I'm going to say pellets dot reset pellets template and what that will do is take the data from the pellets template and copy it into the pellets variable this is how I would reset the data once pellets is all the pellets have been gobbled and I can reset it back to its original state with all the pellets on screen using this line. 
So with a template for resetting and a pellets object for drawing, we can draw the pellets. So at the end of our loop, come here and say G for graphics dot draw underscore pellets. And I have to tell it which pellets to draw and the screen to draw it on. Now save and run it. I should see pellets, but I have an error. And it's line 35. And that's because this needs to be a capital P. My mistake. Save. Run again. And there we go. But it didn't draw the pellets. And I'll show you why. Do you see? I came down to the bottom of the loop, but the update happens before that, so it never puts that on the monitor. This always has to be the last thing in your loop. So, if I fix that, save, run it again, now I see the, the pellets on the screen. So if you make a change and you don't see it appear on the screen, Make sure that you're calling pygame.display.update last. It's always got to be the last thing in the loop. Okay, now we're at step four. So if you need to reset, reset to step four now. And we're moving on to step five. We're going to draw the gobbler on the screen. So, first thing to do is import some graphics files. He's going to need his paths so he knows where to walk. He's going to need a navigator. And then we're going to import the sprite. Once we have those, we can set him up. So paths is just another tile map. So we set it up just like the others. Pass it the tile data. And then we'll create the sprite itself. So with the gobbler variable, we're going to assign it an object created from the gobbler sprite dot gobbler sprite class and that class takes a graphics object G and a navigator don't worry about navigators just yet we have a step just for that for now just type as I type and don't worry about it type void navigator open close parentheses and we'll discuss that later now we're going to need to tell gobbler where to start on the map Otherwise, he'll just start in the upper left corner, and that's not where we want him. So, he has a reset method to tell it to go to his startup position. Now, we're going to need a we're going to need to know the current time. Right here, remember we do a pause so the game doesn't run too quickly. But for animations such as Gobbler where he has frames that he cycles through, we don't want those to run too fast either. So we're going to add a little code here. Game time equals pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And ticks are ticks of the clock. The computer clock is very fast and it'll know to the millisecond, or even closer, how much time has elapsed since the game started. We're going to store that in the game time variable, and we'll use that for our animations. So we're ready to animate the gobbler, 
we'll say gobbler.animate and he knows what his images are and how many there are and which ones to use and he doesn't know how fast to use them so we pass him game time and then he'll know how to regulate that speed but he's still not drawn on the screen so we're going to call gobbler's render method render function and it takes a screen parameter so we'll pass it the screen be sure to save and give it a try and I have an error I've made a typo in line 55 time save try again and there he is in his startup position animated at the right speed drawn on the screen just as we wanted so that was pretty easy so that completes step five so if you're stuck go ahead and reset to step five and we can continue so now we're going to work on step six we're going to move the gobbler around using the keyboard so the first thing we're going to need are the directions so let's have a look at the directions just a little closer I'll save this and if I click on directions it's in italics that's okay for now and let's go over why we have directions so remember that the screen has x and y coordinates which are 0 and 0 in the upper left corner and some positive number as x moves to the right and some positive number as y moves down so if we wanted an object on our screen to move in the right direction we would increase his x value if we want him to move in the downward direction we would increase his y value if we want him to move left we decrease his x value and if we want him to move up we decrease his y value so in the simplest terms of physics if an object has if it's in motion then if there's no resistance no friction nothing in its way it's just free to move and continue moving he'll move at a steady pace he'll move at a constant velocity so in video games we can say that if something has velocity it also has direction because it can have the velocity on the x-axis and velocity on the y-axis when it has velocities on both axes it can move diagonally too so what we do is we have four directions up down left and right and I've added a fifth direction which has no velocity in either direction and it's called stop so if I have velocity in up direction I have a negative one on the y-axis that's the direction it goes in the y velocity if I add this velocity to its current position he'll move up if I add this velocity to its current position he'll move down if I add a negative one which is the same as subtracting one as you would learn in algebra the uh, character will move to the left it would apply to the x-axis if I add one to its position on the x-axis it will move to the right so I've said that about 20 different ways I hope it makes sense I also gave these names just so that I could output them on the console down here while it's running but I have a class direction and I use that name member in the class so that I can display it so the direction class makes direction objects and those direction objects are executed at startup right here I store them in these variables direction stop direction up direction down etc and so these directions have velocities and names and I can use these when I'm moving the characters around by just saying if the gobbler's current direction is an instance of the direction up object then he knows which way he has to move so I also have a list here of all directions 
and I use that just for the map. And we probably won't get into that. That's a little bit complicated. But you can look at it if you want, but you can probably ignore it for now. So if I go back to Gobbler, I've imported my directions, and now I want to apply them. I'm going to go down to where the loop is just done looking for exits, and I'm going to say keys equals pygame dot key dot get underscore pressed open close parentheses the get pressed function is going to read the keyboard and get all of the keys that have been pressed at a time since the last time we checked it's going to store them in this keys variable now that I have a list of all the keys I can check to see which keys were pressed if I care about them so I'm going to use an if and then give it a boolean expression of keys at index k underscore up and then a code block and I'm going to finish this in just a moment but first let's look at what this does keys is a list and so k underscore up is a, an integer value stored as a constant so I don't know what the value is I just know what the name is it's very easy to work with that way so I can pass that into the list and it will tell me if the up arrow is in the list of keys that have been pressed if it has then it will execute this code block and I can tell it to move the, uh, the gobbler in the up direction so gobbler has a function called the temp direction and it requires a maze and it requires paths and it requires the game functions and it requires a direction and remember I've already, already constructed those I have an instance of the direction up I can pass in there I already had an instance of the game functions I already had an instance of gobbler paths and an instance of maze you can see that this function takes a lot of parameters and the reason for that is it has a complicated job to do so if the attempt direction function is called it's going to decide whether the uh, whether the sprite is in a place in the maze where it can go in that given direction or if there's a wall there if he can go there and there's not a wall there then he will change the direction that the gobbler currently has the direction is in the gobbler sprite but he gets it from the maze sprite because all the maze sprites have a direction so here is where it creates a direction on that class so he already has a direction that he's going and I'm just going to try to tell him to go in that direction now I check for the other three directions I check for k underscore down and if that button is pressed gobbler dot attempt direction pass it the maze pass it the paths game functions and a direction of down and then of course I just repeat this twice more first for left and for right that's not G that's F don't make that mistake um, yeah and this needs an underscore there we go okay now if any of those keys are pressed it will try to tell Gobbler to go in the direction of the arrow key that you just pressed on the keyboard but that's not all we have to do if I save this and run it let's see what he does so this is how it looked before but if I press the up key the right key 
the down key and the left key, you can see that it's kind of doing what we want. He can go left and he can go right, but he doesn't actually move. But if I press the up key, he doesn't try to go up. He doesn't change direction. Same thing with the down key. You can't hear me pressing it, but I am up and down, up and down. So it doesn't let him go if there's a wall, but he doesn't really move. We need to tell him to move. So that's a separate thing. He won't do it on his own. So after we animate the gobbler, we need to move the gobbler. And gobbler knows how to move because he has his own position and he has his own direction. But he requires a parameter, game time, because he needs to know how fast to move. We give him a game time. So we save that. And now that we've instructed him to move, look what we have. Goodness me. It's almost like a game, isn't it? One thing you're going to notice, though, even though he won't go up and down unless he's in a valid place to do so, watch what happens if I just let him go. Turn him left. He went right through a wall. So, he won't go through a wall based on the keyboard commands, but he will go through a wall if he's already moving in that direction and he encounters one. So, we'll have to take a separate step to have the navigator control that for us. So we'll press escape and we're done with this step. So if you need to reset, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, that completes step six and we'll move on to step seven. Okay, for step seven, we're going to add a navigator to the gobbler. So remember that when we created the gobbler, we used this void navigator. And I said, don't worry about that for now. Well, now we've got to fix it. So I have a navigator for the gobbler and it's a little bit different from the ghosts because the gobbler isn't just subject to the navigator, he also has to be controlled by the keyboard. So I have a special navigator just for him. And it is a gobbler navigator and it takes parameters of game functions, f, and paths. So gobbler underscore paths. Now that he has a navigator, there's something extra we have to do. And let me explain what the problem is with navigating in this maze. If I open the tiled editor, let's have a look at what this maze looks like. Let me turn off the pellets. Well, maybe I'll leave the pellets. You can see that we have 8x8 eight eight pixel blocks all through this maze. And when the pellets are off, you can see the path is solid. But at any given time, Gobbler may have his center block aligned with one of these blocks, or he may have moved one pixel over so that his left lines here and his right is over here. Well, if he moves four pixels over, his left will be here and his right will be here. So if he's in a position like that, he's actually halfway between this block and this block. And if he's halfway between blocks, there's no way there's going to be a clear path below or above for him to go to. So I only need to check to see if he can go in any given direction if he's fully and perfectly aligned with one of these blocks, that he's landed squarely and perfectly on one. So if he's halfway between, I don't have to check. But if he's always all, all the way on and he's aligned, then I'll check. So I have game functions to test whether these, whether he's between blocks or whether he's landed directly on one. If he's landed directly on one, I say that he is tile aligned. So when he's tile aligned, all kinds of things can happen. He may have landed on pellet, or he may have encountered a ghost, but the ghosts can also be not tile aligned and still collide, so I have to check for them on every frame. So, given that I only have to check for some things every eight pixels, that saves me some time, because games have to be, you know, fast to be performant. You don't want things slowing them down unnecessarily. So I only check to see if you have a collision with a pellet, if you can change directions, if he's tile aligned. So let's write some code that checks to see if he's tile aligned, 
and there are a couple of things to handle when we're title aligned. So we're going to put them all in this area where we check. First, we check to see if what the center rectangle of the gobbler is. I have a function on gobbler called get center rect and it's going to return a rectangle object and that comes from pygame and the gobbler rect has a bunch of members in it. I'm going to use a deconstruction to place those into some variables for me. So p underscore x is the x location of the upper leftmost pixel and p underscore y is the y location of the upper leftmost pixel and then I'm going to use what's called a discard. It's just an underscore for these two and you don't have to worry about that it just means that I'm not going to use those values. I only want the px and the py. And then to finish the deconstruction I use the assignment variable and pass the gobbler rect. So now I have the x and y coordinates of the gobbler's center rectangle. That is the 8x8 pixel area in the center of the gobbler's sprite. Now that I have that I can check to see if we're tile aligned. So if game functions dot pixel is tile aligned p underscore x p underscore y then I have a code block and I'll say tile underscore location tile underscore lock equals function dot tile underscore location of pixel p underscore x p underscore y so let me go over that just a little. So this function, f dot pixel is tile aligned, will tell me if p underscore x comma p underscore y is a tile aligned with the upper left corner of any given tile. So if the upper left corner of Gobbler's center tile is the same place as the upper left corner of any tile, then he is tile aligned. So, when he's tile aligned, I want to find the tile in that location with that pixel. So what that means is if I hover over the very first tile in this map, you can see down here that it is at 0, 0. If I move over to the right just one, it becomes 1, 0. If I go back the other way, left and down, it becomes 0, 1. So there's a grid of tiles with x and y coordinates for the tiles just like the pixels. But it takes 8 pixels to go from 0, 0 to 1, 0. So I'm just translating this pixel to a tile value. The tile value, the tile map location of this tile is 3, 2. So I'm basically just dividing by 8, as you would guess. So now that I have the tile coordinate, I can get the tile xy from that tile loc using another deconstruction, t underscore x, t underscore y equals tile underscore loc. So now that I have t underscore x and t underscore y, I can do whatever I want with those tile locations. I'm not doing anything with it just yet, but I'm going to later. Now we're just going to type gobbler.navigator and have him do his thing by calling his navigate method function. Now that he's done that, let's give it a try. Save the file and run it. And he stopped at the wall. Isn't that swell? Stop for that one. Stop for that one. Looking good. Okay, so he has stopped in all directions for a wall. So we know that's working. Let's move on to the next step. For step eight, we're going to draw the ghosts. 
so there's quite a bit of typing in this one, but we'll go as fast as we can. First we need the paths and the sprites for the ghosts. So import ghost paths, import ghost sprite, So we do our imports, and then we create instances of them. So an instance of Ghost Paths class takes TMX data just like the others, and that creates a Ghost Paths object that we store in the Ghost Paths variable. And then we use that ghost paths to create ghost sprites. So we need to create those one at a time. Each ghost has its own cl uh, sprite class. So ghost yellow will become a new ghost sprite, dot yellow ghost sprite. And he takes graphics and a navigator. Ghost pink. Ghost cyan. And ghost red. Now, if you haven't figured it out by now, if I type just part of the symbol that I'm after, I may get some IntelliSense popping up in front of me. And if it highlights, uh, or if it contains what I'm trying to type, I can navigate to it with the arrow keys or click on it with the mouse, and it will type the rest for me. Since there's only one, I've typed enough of this, it knows it's, there's only one available, it will highlight it. And I can press Enter and it'll type it for me. And that'll save you some typing. Make sure these things are typed properly because it can't help you with those. Now I have four of these set up, but I'm going to be doing quite a few operations with four ghosts. I don't want to type out all the operations on four ghosts four times over and over again. So I'm going to do a little shortcut. I'm going to add these ghosts to a list and whenever I want to perform an operation on all four ghosts, I'll just use a for loop and apply the operation to the ghosts in the list. All ghosts contains ghost yellow. I can arrow up and down here, select yellow and press enter, comma ghost underscore pink comma ghost underscore cyan, comma ghost underscore red. And then I'm going to copy and paste this line down below and change all ghosts to all sprites. And I'm going to include gobbler. So now I can simplify things whenever I want to perform an operation on more than one ghost or more than one sprite. Now that I have all of these ghosts, I'm going to do pretty much the same thing that I did with Gobbler. So instead of saying gobbler.reset, I want to say for Gobbler in all sprites, code colon, tab, gobbler.reset. And so this would work, but this isn't always going to be Gobbler. Sometimes it'll be ghosts, so it won't make sense. So I'm going to change this to sprite. Now, instead of calling dot .reset on five different objects, I can just put it in a for loop and call it once, then it applies to each object in the list. Next, I'll do the same thing for the navigators. Down here, I have a navigate for gobbler, and I'm going to change that to all sprites. and I'll say sprite.navigator.navigate. Now that applies to the ghosts and the gobbler. 
and the same thing with the animate. So I'm going to say four sprite in all sprites, colon, tab, sprite.animate. And then the same thing with the drawing. I'm going to keep the drawing separate from the gobbler though. I probably should make them all the same, but I've actually gone and made this whole presentation with them separate, and I don't want to change it because I don't want to mess anybody up or confuse anybody. This also shows you that I can use the other list as well for ghost in all ghosts, colon, tab, ghost.render, screen. Okay, all set. Now let's see what we get. Ah, we have four ghosts. And they are being animated, but I only made one image for the ghosts, so it doesn't look like they're being animated, because it's always the same thing, just being drawn over and over. So that's something you could fix if you feel ambitious. But this looks like it's working so far. We're not moving, so we need to fix that. So here, we'll do the same thing as before for sprite in all sprites, sprite.move, try again, look at that. Those ghosts just ran right out the window. So they're having the same problem Gobbler had. Once I start to move them, they don't have a navigator to, that knows how to keep them in the maze. So we used the void navigator. We'll have to change that right now. So moving on to step nine. For step nine, this is pretty easy. We're going to take these void navigators and make them proper navigators for the ghosts. You could write all kinds of really cool navigators if you want, that might be an interesting challenge for you. For now, I've just created one, the random navigator, so they have no rhyme or reason for where they go. They just pick on a whim which way they're going to go whenever they are tile aligned and have multiple directions to choose from. The only thing they'll never do is go backward. So, the random, navig sorry, the random navigator takes a game functions parameter and a paths parameter, which is ghost underscore paths, and I'm just going to copy and paste it a few times and save it and in the uh, in the Python coding steps document that I wrote the reset.py I actually didn't do the move in step 8 I did it in step 9 so this part that we did instead in 8 uh, where we move all the sprites at once, uh, this should have been step 9, so don't let that confuse you. In any case, if you're using reset, it'll fix it for you anyway. So this should all be complete, and now they should be bound to the maze. And there they go. They found their way out of the cage, and then they are stuck in the tunnels, just like everyone should be. Okay, we are getting there. Okay, let's move on to step 10. For step 10, we're going to make Gobbler actually gobble the pellets, because right now he's running around in the maze and chomping along, but none of the pellets are disappearing. So we're going to fix that. First thing we're going to do is go back to the part where we look for tile alignment. And remember I said I'm not using tile oak just yet? We're going to now. We're going to look for a pellet at this location, and if we're tile aligned, We'll enter this code block and check to see if pellet equals pellets uh, spell it right dot pellet at and we have our tile location. We want to know if our tile location has a pellet. So I'll pass t underscore x, t underscore y. And if that pellet is not none, then we do something here. Now, what this means is when I 
do pellet at, it's going to return a pellet object, which is coming out of the tile map, or it's going to return none, and it doesn't contain a tile. So that pellet might be one of these little pellets, or it might be one of the power pellets. Or, if he's on one of these green spaces between, there will be none. He, or if he managed to make it off the path, on any other, one of these other places, it could also return none, because there's nothing there. Uh, that shouldn't happen, we've taken steps so that it doesn't happen, but if it were uh, any other part of the grid, uh, it would return none. But we should only ever have to check for the ones on the path. So it'll return a regular pellet, or a power pellet, or none. So we check to see if it's none, and if it's not none, then we have a pellet of some kind. So if we check to see all of the members in the pellet, uh, then we can kind of look to see what we're up against. Uh, fix that there. So these parameters, uh, let's look at them for a moment. This is the x coordinate of the pellet, the y coordinate of the pellet. And let me show you what a GID is. If I come up to the assets in tiles, here's my TMX file. And if I look at it, you can see these are numbers. But if you look at it from just the right angle, or far away, you can see that it's actually the maze. If you look at the thumbnail over here on the scroll bar, you can actually see the maze. So these numbers actually represent which of the tiles are selected over here. So this tile is one, this one's two, this one's three, etc. I might have that wrong, but you get the idea. So if it's not mapped, it's a zero. If it's mapped to something in the grid, then it'll have a number from one to uh, uh, or, or up. So if I want to know which tile I'm looking for, I can look in here and see these numbers in the TMX file, and I can determine that uh, the borders are twos and sixes and threes. If I'm looking at uh, this is the uh, the maze, if I find the layer for uh, paths, I can see the valid paths are 68. And if I come down here to this layer, this one is the ghost paths layer, and this one is the pellets. So here are the pellets. You can see that they're staggered, and there's going to be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And if we go down, it's 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 96. So I know that the ones are the regular pellets, the zeros are nothing, no space, and the power pellets are 196. Now that I have that information, I want to come back to the code and ask if what I just encountered was a 1 or a 196. But the TMX library, PyTMX, doesn't give me those values up front by itself. It has its own GID values. We want to ignore that and use the tiled GID because I don't know what their GID is. The tiled GID is the one that I can find in the TMX file. So I do this deconstruction, I get the tiled GID, and now that I have it, I can say, is it a power pellet? And if the GID is not equal to zero, then I check that tiled GID and see if it's 196. If the tiled GID is 196, then I know that it was a power pellet. I can store that in the is power pellet variable, and I take some action. And that action is the game function power up. It's going to require a game time, 
a gobbler, and the ghosts. So now I've eaten that pellet and I need to take it out of the pellets map. So I'm going to say pellets dot gobble and, and the location t underscore x t underscore y so it knows what to take out of the map and that will remove it. Now that that is all done I'm going to have a problem because I have to decide when the power up ends because those power pellets don't last forever. So in the power up this is already written for you but inside here it has a variable on the class called power up and I set it to true on power up and then I set the power up until variable and I give it a time in the future so I say the current game time plus 1000 milliseconds which is one second times the number of seconds that I want it to last and that's going to be the point in the future where it the power up stops and expires. So I have another function called power up expired which checks this power up until and checks to see if it's in the future or in the past. If it's in the past then the power up has expired and we need to power down. So it'll check the current game time see if it's greater than power up until and if it is then it's true. So back here at Gobbler I need to come out here and say if f dot powered up expired and give it the game time then go into this code block and f dot power down and pass it the gobbler and the ghosts and that will power him back down so let's give that a try. So first I have pellets being gobbled. That's good. Next I'm going to try a power pellet. So as soon as I eat it the ghosts got scared and turned white and we need to see if they stopped being scared and they did. The timeout worked the power up expired and it called power down and everything went back to normal. So now we have uh, pellets being gobbled, power pellets being gobbled and our ghosts going into afraid mode for a temporary period and then it comes back after it's cooled down as it should. Excellent. Let's move on to the next step, step 11. In step 11 we're going to add some sound right now we have most of our game going but we don't have any sounds at all for it so let's get started with the sound initialization there are two things you need to do we already have your Pygame in it and that does most of the initialization for Pygame but for sound we need two more so before Pygame init we're going to add pygame.mixer.preinit and that needs to come before the Pygame init and it takes a few parameters. 22,050 is the first one, minus 16 is the second, then 2, 256 for the last. You don't have to trouble yourself with understanding what these values are. You can look them up on the Pygame website if you like, but these are values that you can use for pretty much anything. I've built several games with them and never had any trouble with them. The only reason to adjust them is if you have performance problems or if the sound doesn't sound right, if you've got some clicking or popping or if it takes too long to play, anything like that. But they should be fine as they are. The second line is going to come after pygame.init and it is pygame.mixer.init. So now we're wired for sound. We need to import our sound. And that class in that module has everything we need to play sound effects and music. So for step 11 we're just doing sound effects and there 
we need to add them to the setup. Here. Now, I cheated a little bit early on when I passed none for this parameter at the beginning because we just weren't here yet, but this actually is the sounds parameter. So we need a variable that contains an instance of game sounds. So we create an instance of the game sounds class, store it in the variable s, and pass it as the second parameter to the game functions constructor. Now, we need to go through the game and tell it when to play the sounds. And primarily we only have two sound effects. We have one, well, sorry, three sound effects. We have one when he eats a pellet, one when he eats a power pellet, and one when he chomps a ghost. So all of the power pellet gobbling happens down here. So if this is a power pellet, then we gobble the power pellet, but also call sound s dot sound gobble and that's a a wave sound effect as an object and then we say dot play open and close parentheses and then if it's not a power pellet we want to use the else and create a new code block and play oh i'm sorry i have this backward s dot sound underscore gobble dot play I put it in close for in, but this one should be crunch. There. Now, the third sound effect is not something we're going to have to put in here. It's actually built into one of the other modules already, and so we, we won't have to add that one. So I'll just save this and retry. <laughs> And that works fine. He says gobble, gobble, gobble as he's eating his pellets. And we'll see what the big one does. Crunch. Crunch. Good. Now the third sound effect should happen when we collide with the ghost, but we don't have collisions in place yet. So it'll play once we have those in place. Let's move on to the next step. Step 12 is really easy. We're going to add some background music. So we've already added the sound effects, and that means that our Pygame sound mixer is already initialized. So really all we have to do is start with some background music at startup. And we do that with s.play, and I have two pieces of music available. There's casual and urgent. And normally we'd be playing casual music. And then when Gobbler eats a power pellet and powers up, we'll switch to the urgent music. And then when it expires and the ghosts aren't afraid anymore, we'll switch back to casual. Now this method doesn't really do a whole lot. Let's have a look at it. When we look inside and it's a function, it just says pygame.mixer.music.load and it takes a file name So it's really just a one line, and then a second line to start playing it. Pygame.mixer.music.play. Now the negative one just tells it to play repeat and repeat forever. That's the number of times to, to loop. If I put a negative one, it'll play forever until I tell it to stop. And if I want it to stop, I have a method for that. Whatever song is playing at the time, it'll the music will just be turned off and nothing will play again until I call one of the play methods. So, at startup, it'll start playing the casual music. Save it first and give it a try. Sure enough, and that works great. But, when I, when I eat a power pellet, it doesn't change. So let's do that next. And the place where I eat a power pellet happens here. So where I power up, I want to say s dot play music urgent. Now I can set that music to urgent, but I also have to turn off back to casual when the power pellet wears off. 
so that's easy to do we already have code for that uh, here in if, if the power up is expired then we can say as dot play music casual but there's a problem here and it, I, I would show it to you but it's not obvious even then what's going to happen is this will always run uh, every time it, in that while loop in our infinite loop every time it runs this code will say the power up has expired and set the music to casual and so it actually restarts the music 60 times a second and the music actually never plays you can't hear it we only want to do this one time when the power pellet expires and then not do it again until they power up and then power down again so we need to put in a little check here to keep it from running constantly and that is before we power down if f dot powered up then power down and we don't want to power down if we're already powered down it'll just reset the music over and over so you can save that and test it Crunch. but that didn't work I've done something wrong let's have a look see what I did here don't forget those let's try again Crunch. there we go so now we're playing the urgent music and return to normal when the ghosts become normal again when the power pellets wore off Crunch. so that seems to be working fine all right let's move on to the next step in step 13 we're going to add checks to see if gobbler has any collisions with ghosts that's going to do a couple of things first it allows us to die and second it allows us to chomp the ghosts and third it allows us to hear the sound effects when we're chomping the ghosts so in here right after we navigate before we do the drawing we're going to check for collisions with ghosts so we'll do a check on each ghost using a for loop for each ghost in all ghosts for each one go into this code block and we'll set the value variable has collision to the result of function dot check ghost collision and it requires a gobbler and a ghost and we'll check to see if those two collide if they have the same center rectangle there's a collision and it will return true so we'll store the result in has collision now if has collision equals true then we'll enter this code block and we will chomp that ghost if it doesn't have a collision then nope I've screwed this up if it has a collision we need to know if the ghost is scared or not so if ghost is scared then we chomp otherwise if the ghost is not scared he haunts us f dot haunt ghost gobbler so that allows us to die or chomp ghosts let's give it a spin and see what it does save the file and run now we didn't actually put in a way for the game to end we just put in a check for collisions so if I hit one of these ghosts it's going to make a sound but the game continues if I hit a power pellet on a chomp, chomp I get the chomp chomp and it sends them back to the cage so all the collisions seem to be working don't let it trouble you that we don't have a way to end the game yet because we know that if I touch the ghost that the, the collision is working because we can hear the sound we'll work on game ending last so we have one more thing to do before we end the game and that is step 14 we're going to add the portal 
For step 14, we're going to add the portal, and the portal is really easy. What we're going to do is come up here and make a note of where it is. When we look at the maze map in Tiled, we have a coordinate of 1,28 on the left and a coordinate of 53,28 on the right. So those are the two squares that we want to watch to see if Gobbler goes into them, and if he does, we want to take some action. Now that we have those locations noted, we'll come down to the place in the code where we want to add that check. So if the current tile location of the center square of Gobbler is the same location as the left portal and Gobbler's direction is direction underscore left then he's going into the portal on the left side and we will tell him to come out on the right side. We'll say set the center tile position for Gobbler to the right portal. The index at 0 is x and the index at 1 is y and it's going to appear on the other side of the screen. Now we'll just do the same thing for the other side in the other direction and we'll have a two-way portal. And I think that should do it. It should be pretty easy. Save it and see what it does. Hey, hey, hey! We have a two-way portal. That was easy. All right. Now, here in step 15, we're going to add the game over functionality. Now, there's a reason I added this last. And that is, if I add the game over functionality right away, as soon as we have collisions, it makes it really hard to test the game after that, because I have to run around avoiding ghosts the whole time. And my ability to test the game is based on my ability to play the game. And it's always nice to have the ability to test the game without having to worry about whether or not you're any good at it. Uh, so, it's the last thing that I add. Now... What we're going to do is we have one infinite game loop, and as games become more complex, you probably should have a design that uses multiple game loops so that you, you're only running one at a time. You can choose whether the game should run the game loop that has a title screen, or the gameplay, or the settings menu, or the game over screen. Now this game is pretty simple, so we don't have to do it that way. And we'll just take a little shortcut. We'll use the same game loop, but we're going to have an if block that says if the game is over, show the game over screen. If it's not over, then play the game. So what we have in here right now is all code to play the game. So right in the top of my loop here, just under where I check to quit, because you always want to be able to quit the game, I'm going to say, if the game is over, show the game over screen. Now we have a game function for that. If game function dot game over, then enter this code block. Remember that pass is what we use to have an empty code block. And then I'm going to have an else code block. And if the game is not over, the else code block is going to continue to play everything that we've coded so far. But 
because this all belongs in a code block now, I have to indent the whole rest of this code block by one indentation. So be very careful when you do this. Click on this first line, and you can use the arrow keys or the home key to move all the way to the left so that your cursor is at the beginning of that first line. And then you can scroll down, and you see the last line here? You can hold the shift key on the keyboard and click your mouse, and it will highlight all those lines between them. So scroll back up and make sure that it highlighted what you think it should, and it highlighted everything I expected it to. It highlighted everything up to the first line under the else. Now I'm going to press the tab key on the keyboard, and it indented everything for me by one indentation. So now you can see this code block begins at the right indentation under this else. Now I'm going to click anywhere the highlight will go away, and I can save the file. Now that should all still be valid code. So, I just need to add the game over code here. So, I'm going to say g.draw maze, because I want to show the maze on game over. And then I'm going to say g.draw pellets, because I want it to show the pellets. I'm going to draw the gobbler. And in the game over, it may be that he ran into a ghost, uh, and he was hunting you, and you got haunted, and then you died. Or you may have finished the game and eaten all the pellets, in which case you win. So I need to decide which one it is. If you win, Draw, you, win. If you didn't win, draw, you died. That's pretty easy. Now, the you win variable is set when, when you get haunted or when you finish all the pellets. So it knows whether you've won or not. It does that almost for you. So I think this will do the job. Let's give it a try. First we'll die because it's the easy one. That's all it should do and it works perfectly. Now I'll press escape and try again and see if I can't clear the board and test the winning scenario. Crunch. Well, that didn't work at all, did it? So it looks like I've missed something. I need to tell it that the pellets are all gone. So here where we're eating the pellets, I do a gobble, but I have to check if pellets dot all gone is true. And if it is, then I need to say the game is over and we won. Now let's give this a try and see if we can beat it. Crunch. Crunch. And there you go. That's it. The game works. The game is complete. I hope you've enjoyed it. Feel free to uh, get on the website for help and expand on it yourself, and I hope you learn something.